The sudden disappearance of Oregon sea otters after they had been reintroduced from the fur trade is an enduring mystery that marine biologists have been trying to solve for decades. Nearly hunted to extinction during the fur trade, the last sea otter native to Oregon was killed in 1906. In 1970 and 71, around 100 otters were relocated from Alaska to the Oregon coast. For about 10 years, the sea otters thrived and everything pointed to a successful reintroduction. But then, Oregon sea otters vanished. What happened? Why does it matter? And what does this mystery mean to future plans to reintroduce sea otters to the Oregon coast? I'm KP, and I'm a marine biologist who has worked with sea otters for the better part of the last 15 years. Before the start of the maritime fur trade, there were an estimated 150,000 to 300,000 sea otters here in the North Pacific. From the Baja California Peninsula, all the way up across the Pacific Rim to Japan. By the end of the fur trade, there were only 1,000 to 2,000 sea otters left in small pockets of their former range. This population rebounded largely thanks to regulations like the Marine Mammal Protection Act, various conservation programs, and reintroductions that took place in the late 60s and early 70s. These reintroduction programs saw hundreds of sea otters transported from Alaska down to the coasts of the Pacific Northwest. 89 sea otters were flown or shipped to British Columbia. Today, those 89 otters have grown to the population of over 5,000. 59 sea otters were moved to Washington in 1969. That population has grown to an estimated 2,000 sea otters. These reintroductions are widely considered to be one of the greatest triumphs in conservation history. But for some reason, Oregon was a different story, and it doesn't really add up. The Oregon coast is an ideal environment for sea otters. It has rocky, nearshore marine habitats where sea otters typically thrive. It's home to an abundance of sea otters' preferred prey, including sea urchins, clams, and crabs. So why did the reintroduction efforts fail in Oregon? It doesn't appear that they simply died off because there were no noted unusually high mortality events. It also doesn't seem like it was the number of starting sea otters since the number reintroduced in Oregon was actually larger than the Washington and BC populations, and those populations thrived. For a long time, the theory that made the most sense was that the otters simply left. Sea otters have strong homing instincts, and waters that are unfamiliar to them can be disorienting and frustrating. They are not a migratory species, and females typically establish a very small home range, usually just 5 to 10 miles or 8 to 16 kilometers. Relocating them is difficult, and we've seen it with problem otters. Just like problem bears, there are animals that have either lost their natural fear of humans or become habituated to humans, usually because humans are getting too close to them or even feeding them, which can lead to dangerous interactions. A famous example is Otter 841, who went viral for approaching surfers and stealing their surfboards. Problem otters are sometimes relocated, but this doesn't always work because they'll quickly return to their home range if they're able. And that's what many biologists believed happened to the Oregon sea otters, that they left in search for familiar waters, presumably north into Washington or even further. But there's still a missing piece of the puzzle here. Several of the released sea otters stayed in Oregon for about 10 years and raised at least 17 pups. Why did the sea otters leave? Why didn't they leave right away, more specifically? Why stay in Oregon for almost a decade before disappearing? Recent studies looked for an answer in the different types of sea otters. To the untrained eye, sea otters might all look the same, but there are actually three different subspecies of sea otters. The southern, northern, and Asian sea otters. Each has morphological and behavioral differences. The most notable difference is their size. Southern sea otter females can grow up to around 50 pounds or 22 kilograms. Northern sea otter females can be 70 pounds or 30 kilograms. Their skulls are also a bit different. Northern sea otters have significantly larger teeth and mandibles, while southern sea otters have smaller teeth and longer snouts or rostrums. These physical differences resulted in behavioral and dietary differences as well. Many sea otters will use tools like rocks to break into things like clams. And this is actually more common with southern sea otters than it is with the Alaskan sea otters. Northern sea otters tend to try to break into hard shells with their teeth first and only result to tools if that fails. 
This study found that northern sea otters used tools during just 1% of dives, while southern sea otters used tools 16% of the time. These differences led marine biologists to ask a new question. What if the sea otters that were relocated to Oregon were the wrong kind of sea otters? What if the Alaskan otters couldn't find their preferred prey or ran out of their preferred prey through overpredation or overfishing, or maybe weren't suited for the environment in Oregon at all? Now here's a study where researchers analyzed the genotypes of 16 pre-fur trade otter skulls from archeological sites along the central and southern Oregon coast. The study found that before the fur trade, the skulls from these sites most closely resembled southern sea otters. This led a biologist who documented the disappearance of Oregon sea otters to wonder if it might have been better if we could have brought animals up here from California. Unfortunately, that wasn't an option. Back in the 70s, the California otter population was still critically endangered and struggling to recover. They couldn't afford to lose even a single otter. But a more recent study found that the picture is more complicated. Researchers were able to extract genetic sequences from the otter teeth found in the northern Oregon archaeological sites. Using non-invasive measures that preserved the artifacts, the team scraped calculus off the teeth from fur trade era sea otters. They found that it wasn't southern sea otters who were closer to Oregon's archaeological and historical otters, but northern sea otters. The study suggests this probably reflected the more northern archaeological sites where the samples were collected, while the samples from the previous study came from the more southern locations along the coast. This means that Oregon probably served as a transitional zone between southern and northern sea otters and could serve a similar function today. If you're a fan of my channel, you probably already know there are ongoing efforts to bring sea otters back to the Oregon coast with the potential for reintroduction in the coming years. One of the key organizations leading these efforts is a team of indigenous leaders, conservationists, marine biologists, and sea otter specialists called the Alaka Alliance. They're a personal favorite of mine, and you can learn more about them by clicking on this link right up here. The Alaka Alliance is using the data and studies I've talked about to build a plan for a successful reintroduction. Such a plan includes selecting the right kind of otters for Oregon, potentially moving southern sea otters from California to regions in the southern coast of Oregon, while using northern sea otters from Washington or Alaska to repopulate the upper half of the Oregon coast. This matters because sea otters are a keystone species that play a critical role in maintaining the health and stability of their ecosystem, just like a keystone in an arch. While the keystone is actually under the least pressure, without it, the entire arch would collapse. The ecosystem we're talking about are kelp forests. These underwater forests have extremely high rates of primary productivity, meaning they produce massive amounts of organic matter from photosynthesis. Kelp forests support more biodiversity and sequester more carbon than similar sized redwood groves. They provide several ecological services like water filtration. Kelp forests buffer waves, absorb power from storms, and prevent coastal erosion. They also support fisheries and contribute to the local economy. Unfortunately, kelp forests in the North Pacific need sea otters. This graph shows kelp density before the fur trade and after. This is because sea otters prey on sea urchins who are the dominant marine herbivore. Without sea otters to keep them in check, a herd of sea urchins can consume kelp at a rate of 30 feet per month, turning once vibrant ecosystems into underwater deserts known as urchin barrens. Now the good news is that studies clearly show that when sea otters are reintroduced, kelp forests have not only come back, but have flourished. Kelp has grown almost 60% where sea otters are present. That's why marine biologists are trying so hard to solve the mystery of Oregon's disappearing sea otters. So the next reintroduction could have a better chance of success and to help the health of Oregon's vital kelp forests.